This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. In the name of the one who came from his place of glory and, and honor to serve us, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. An, an interesting thing happened to me and my wife when we were traveling. Years ago when we were getting ready to fly for five hours on our honeymoon, we uh, boarded the plane, we sat down in our seats. And as we were sitting there in our seats, there were two men who came up and came down the aisle of the plane and they looked at their tickets and they looked at our seats and looked at their tickets and looked at our seats and they said, you're in our seats. We said, no, we're, we're, we're in our seats. And it turned out we had the same tickets. And so they called the flight attendant over and she went and she checked things out and it turns out they had overbooked the flight. We both were supposed to be sitting in, in those seats. Well, she had found out that we were on our honeymoon and so she gave our seats to the other two gentlemen. And she said, come with me. And we got moved up to first class. I don't know if you've ever flown first class. First class is great. Everyone had a TV screen of their own. We had a complimentary glass of wine with our meal. Also, since we were on our honeymoon, uh, they gave us a bottle of wine to go. After the meal, you get a hot, warm, wet cloth. You can wipe off your face. You can wipe off your hands. There's a lot more leg room to stretch out, and there's fewer people, so you get a lot more attention in first class. You also get to board the plane first and get off first. You know, it's interesting that experiences like that are often what people make as a goal. That's a, a goal in life, isn't it? To be able to drive around in a, in a limo and have someone else drive me. To be able to pull up to a, a fancy golf course and have someone else come out and get my clubs and send them off to the first tee, clean them when, when I'm all done, go to a spa and uh, get the full treatment. This is a, a goal in life. Have someone else clean my house, drive me around, do my errands. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with any of those things. But isn't it interesting that many people make that a goal in life that now you've arrived and now you are somebody because you have other people at your service. Today, Jesus turns it around. He talks about serving others and he actually says a goal of Christians is to be the servant. What a novel idea. As we think about that today, we're going to look into 1 Peter chapter 4, and we're going to see what Peter says about servants and service and the rewards that God gives to those who do serve. We read in 1 Peter 4, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. As we begin a look at uh, the word serve and service today, uh, maybe a look at the original word would, would be helpful. The, the word in Greek is diakonaas. And you almost can hear an English word in there, can't you? Diakonaas. Deacon. Deacon. The word deacon means someone who's a servant or who simply serves. And the word originally meant to wait on a table. That was a diaconus. And as a person waited on a table, that sure is an act of serving, isn't it? But then later it generally just means to, to be a servant to other people. Now to the Greeks, that was not a goal. It was not a goal to become a servant. In fact, you were born to rule. Romans were the same way. Born to rule. Born to be a Caesar or a centurion, not a slave or a servant. Jesus had much to say about serving, though. Listen to what he says in Matthew 20. Jesus called his disciples together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. 
just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus pointed to himself as the example of this, and he said greatness comes about and a leader comes about when he is shown to be a servant. Now, Jesus had to come and be a servant because mankind had served themselves. If you remember back to the first sin, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God's one command and ate of that forbidden fruit in the first paradise, what were they really saying? They were really saying, we don't want to serve you, God, and obey you. We know what's best for us. This is what's best for us. We're going to do this and put ourselves and serving ourselves above serving you. And when they did that, they ushered sin and sorrow and sadness and death into the world. And ever since that time, mankind has been very good at serving themselves. How about you? Husbands, are you pretty good servants? Have you been good servants lately? Or do you like being the lord of your castle? Wives, are you good at being servants? And on days that you have served very well, is it with a bit of resentment and a scowl on your face because you seem to be doing everything for everybody else around the house? Workers, employees, have you been a servant in the workplace doing your level best? Or have there been days where you've said, I'm not going to go the extra mile on that or stay an extra half hour. That's not in my job description. Or if we think of children in the house. Children, are you good servants? Would you like to serve your brother? Do you enjoy serving your sister? Or do you rather butt heads and, and clash more often than be servants to one another? By nature, we do not have a heart for service. By nature, we are rather self-serving. But that's when Jesus Christ came as the greatest servant and served us in the best way. And when Jesus served as our Savior, he didn't do it in the Superman sort of way. He didn't swoop in from Krypton and, and simply obliterate the enemies and, in a blaze of glory. But no, he took on our human nature and he came and lived a life that we could never live. He lived a perfect life following God's commands as our substitute in our place. And then Jesus bowed himself low enough so that he became arrested and condemned and crucified so that he could die for the sin of the world. That's how he served as the greatest servant of all and as our Savior. Not only does Jesus serve us, service save us, but it also shows us how we now live. He said this in John 13. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. And he asked them, Do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. And now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Remember Jesus' example and his words, for we have the same attitude now today. And actually, in our life of service, you will find more rewards in doing and in giving than you will from getting. Just think about that for a second. That may seem like a, like a novel concept also, but if you've been around the block a few times in life, you probably know how you get more rewards and satisfaction and fulfillment in giving and in serving than you do from sitting back and being served. So how do we do it? How do we follow Jesus' example here? Peter writes, Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength that God provides so that in all things God may be praised. There are some key words in those verses that we need to remember. One of the key words is each. Each one should use the gift that he has received. Everybody. Everybody has been given some talent or some gift or some inclination with which they can serve. 
You know how, how different people's talents are and personalities are. Each one has gotten at least one talent to serve with. Also, there's a word received. You have received it. It's a gift from God. It's, it's not even to be thought of as coming from your parents. Although you might have some gifts and talents that have been passed down through the, the family line, but we think first and foremost that God gave you your gifts and your talents and your personality with which to serve. Then, strength. God not only gives the gifts, he also continues to give the strength as we, he provides that along the way so that we can continue to serve. Another key word is various. Various. There are many different gifts that are given in many different areas. And then a fifth word to remember is faithful. We faithfully administer this. We are faithful servants. We do, we do not neglect our gifts. What a shame that would be if someone had a great gift and they never used it, never developed it, never tried it, never trained it. What a tragedy that would be for God had given that gift to them. So where do we serve with our various gifts? Well, the first place we think of is in our home. You are a servant of others in, in your home. Is that appealing? Is that appealing to go home this week and to, to be a servant? We might say, well, you, you be a servant first, and then, then I'll be a servant to you. I want to see if you're going to be a servant. God says, no, we think of being servants first. To my shame, I, I remember an incident that happened when I was growing up. I was uh, just a boy in my house, and there were three children in my, in my family. And I remember uh, my mom had all kinds of jobs for us to do during the week just to chip in and be part of the family. Uh, one of us would clean up the kitchen, others would help in the garden, we'd have yard work to do, cleaning to do. And I remember once I was in my cranky mood, she asked me to do an extra job that day, and I said, what, am I a slave around here? That did not go over too well with my mother, and I don't think I ever said that again. But really, if we look at it, what should the answer be? Am I a servant here? The answer is yes. Serve one another in our homes. We don't act like the Lord and think of being in that role first and foremost. A second place that we can serve is in our community as we can. Being at the beck and call of others and being a friendly person and a witness to them. And a third place, of course, is our church. God can use gifts and talents in specific ways in a congregation. And if we think about that, think about how you look at your church. I think people first and foremost think of their church as a place that serves them. And, and that's okay because your church should serve you. It should give you the word of God. It should serve your word and sacrament. It should help you with spiritual growth. It should be there for your counseling when, when you need a, a spiritual guide. Your church is here for you. But also, you are here for your church to use your talents and gifts to make its ministries and its operation a smoother and a better place. Paul once wrote about that in Romans 12 where he said, just as each of us has one body with many members and these members do not all have the same function, so also in Christ we who are many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him do it diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. There are many more that we could look at in the New Testament. Many gifts to use for the operation of your congregation. And if we think about it, we almost could put it in, in different categories. For example, on a Sunday morning, there are many ways people use gifts to serve with the setup, with the organization, with the greeting, with the preparations, with the music. For a church's outreach program, if you're going to do things beyond just personal friendship witnessing, which is probably the best way to share your faith, if you're going to do anything as a group, you need people who are willing to help. Leadership holding a position on a board or a committee or the church council, office work behind the scenes, property and maintenance work, tracking your finances. We, we could list many, many different ways people use gifts to make their church and its ministries 
a better place. And when those are done well, people are served. The word of God is presented well, and God is praised. When it doesn't happen well, ministry limps, and a church struggles on, and God has to overcome our own weaknesses. You know, it's good for a church to help people identify what their gifts are and to help them find opportunities for service. And that's why in the bulletin today, there's a colored insert that does just that. This is something you should take along with you when you go home today, maybe look at a little bit later. It's amazing how many things happen around a church where people can use their gifts and make their church a better place and its ministries operate more smoothly. Take that home and think about how God could use you for service in your congregation. Peter then gives one last point here today in these two verses. He talks about where the praise goes at the end when he says, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Peter knew where the glory went for any successes that might come along the way. The Apostle Paul knew that too. Paul once wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. Peter and Paul knew praise goes to God for everything that might happen in an earthly ministry. And we must remember that as well. For, for people who do children's ministries, if you get to the end of a year and you've really seen some great spiritual growth in the children, you, you've seen a real successful year with, with <clears throat> Bible stories presented and, and songs sung, you say, God be praised. God be praised. And thank the Lord he gave us a staff that can do that. If you look at a building project or something with a facility and it turned out really well and it looks really nice, praise God. Praise God for letting us be able to accomplish that for the, the betterment of our ministry. When you get to the end of a worship service and things went well and the music was fine and the message came across and was really edifying, you say, praise God. Praise God for leading that and giving that any success it might have had. When you're at work and you use your gifts with other co-workers and a project goes well, praise God and maybe even tell them that too. Whatever a church accomplishes, is to the praise and the glory of God and not the congregation itself. So today, may God give you a heart of service. A heart of service like your Savior who came and served you first. A heart of service that identifies gifts and, and uses them to God's glory. And then a heart of service that always gives the credit where it belongs, to the Lord himself. And as we do that, May we always be motivated by the one who served us when we served ourselves and when we had gone our own way because he served as our Savior to now give us a purpose in this life. Amen.